Okay, in this example, I am going to demonstrate uh, using D altros, which is shown here in the straight chain uh, structure, Fisher projection, uh, is shown on the left. I'm going to show you how to cyclize that to create, and for this example, I'm going to try to create uh, alpha D altro pyranose. So that'll be the structure I attempt to make from this straight chain uh, structure on the left. So uh, if you pause the video, uh, go ahead and give it a try, and then come back to the video and I will go through the rest of the example. Okay, uh, anytime I start off on one of these structures, the first thing I do is I number the carbons. Notice there is a chain of carbons in this molecule. And because monosaccharides are basically um, aldehydes and ketones, uh, going back to organic chemistry, we learn that the carbonyl carbon of an aldehyde or ketone, when numbering the carbons, gets the lowest number possible. So the carbonyl carbon is the one that's double bonded to an oxygen. And so we'll look at our straight chain structure. And we're going to number the chain of carbons. There are six carbons in the chain, so we'll number them one to six. We can either start at the bottom of the structure and work our way up. That would put the number six on the carbon at the top, which is the carbonyl carbon. And that would be incorrect because that gives it a very high number. Uh, what we want to do is actually number it from top down in this case because notice that gives the carbon, carbonyl carbon the lowest number possible, or in this case, carbon number one. Second thing to note is that we're going to make a pyranose. A pyranose is a six-membered ring or six-atom ring. We know that sugars always have one oxygen in the ring. So for this to be true, we must have one oxygen in the ring and then five carbons in the ring to give us a grand total of six. And so we can draw the skeleton structure of that uh, pyranose and this is the most typical way that these are drawn. If you go into on the line or, or in the textbook, usually you'll see the skeleton structure of the pyranose look like this, where the oxygen is sort of in that 1 or 2 o'clock position, if you kind of thought of that uh, cyclical structure there as a clock. The oxygen sits about 1 or 2 o'clock on that. But you could actually put it wherever you wanted. It wouldn't matter. Um, but this is the most typical way you would see it. Okay, so we know, we, we know those two things. So let's go back to our straight chain structure and talk about how this cyclizes and the reaction that occurs. The reaction that occurs for cyclization to happen is that the carbonyl carbon reacts with a hydroxyl group. And you can see in this structure that carbons uh, 2, and I'll underline the hydroxyl groups, carbon 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 all have hydroxyl groups, so all of them have the capability, at least chemically, to form a bond with that carbon, uh, that carbonyl carbon sitting on, car which is carbon number one in this structure. So any of those could do it, but we want to make the pyranose form. So we want to make sure when we cyclize this that we have um, uh, a six-membered ring, and five of them must be carbons. And so we know that the carbonyl carbon will be one of the carbons in the group. And so if we count through five carbons starting there, we can see that we would use carbon one, two, three, four, and five. And it's the hydroxyl group from the fifth carbon that will attack uh, uh, the carbonyl carbon. So it's going to attack or go that direction right there. Um, now we know that oxygen only likes two bonds, and if oxygen tries to bond to that carbon, that's not going to uh, be very good for oxygen. It'll have three bonds on it. The carbonyl carbon will have five bonds. We have some bonding issues that we got to clean up. So let me just give you just a brief what happens in this case. I'm not going to do uh, arrow pushing and electrons and show how they bounce around so much. If you want more details on that, you can uh, go into the textbook or an organic chemistry textbook and see how that all works. Um, I'm just going to get rid of that arrowhead because we're going to make a bond here. Um, and let me just clean up that bond. So the bond goes there. The, the hydrogen sitting on our hydroxyl group will disappear. Uh, it'll disappear in the reaction. Well, it won't disappear. It'll just 
um, come off of that oxygen molecule. And the oxygen uh, that's double bonded to that carbon, the carbonyl oxygen, will also lose one of its bonds uh, in this process. And the hydrogen that was lost at the hydroxyl group essentially shows up um, with that oxygen that was originally part of the carbonyl group. And so now we have one of my bonds there. looks like it was destroyed in the erasing. Um, so now that's the uh, uh, bonding that will happen. And now notice the carbon, the carbonyl, the original carbonyl carbon has four bonds to it. It's happy. The oxygen down on carbon number five has two bonds. It's happy. And now we have our cyclical structure, our, our, our connection there. And so now we can go over to our cyclical structure and number the carbons of the ring based on the numbering system we have in the straight chain formula. Uh, the oxygen here in the straight chain that I'm going to that let me change color here so we can visualize it a little bit better. Uh, this oxygen is part of the ring, right? You can see it's connected and you can see the ring structure uh, from our straight chain. Carbon number one is part of the ring structure. Carbon number two. Three, four, and five. All those guys are part of the structure. Notice we have six things circled, and so those are the six members of our ring, i.e., it's a pyranose. And so we can just number the carbons now. So we can go through and number these carbons. So we'll call this carbon number one, carbon number two, carbon number three, carbon number four, and carbon number five will be at each of those vertices of our cyclical structure. And so there is the base unit, or, or sort of our, we're building our skeleton structure here of our uh, cyclical structure of altros. Um, each of those vertices in our cyclical structure are carbon, so they must have four bonds to them. So the typical way we show the four bonds is by adding a couple more bonds to what's already there. Notice each of the carbons only had two bonds to it in our, our previous structure. By adding those lines in, now each of those vertices has four bonds to it. Again, it's a carbon, it's going to have four bonds. So now we have our carbons numbered, we have four bonds shown, we just got to make sure we get all the bonding uh, to be correct. So the last part is we're going to add in the extra atoms that hang off the ring structure. And so I'll do this in a, a different color so we can see where everybody's coming from. Uh, let's start, I always start at the bottom, or at the highest number, the fifth carbon in this case, the highest numbered carbon in the ring. Um, and so let's go down to the fifth carbon in our straight chain structure, and let's circle the other two groups of atoms that will be bound to carbon number five that are not part of the cyclical structure in terms of the members of the ring. So carbon number five, there's this group that I haven't accounted for yet that's hanging on carbon number five in this group that's hanging on carbon number five. So those two groups are still hanging on to carbon number five. Um, we draw, because we're in the D, because I have D uh, altros, anytime you have D, the big group goes up, and so we can draw our CH2OH in the up position. And then the other thing that's bound to carbon number five is a hydrogen. So because CH2OH is up, the only left place it can go is down. Notice the other two things bound to carbon number five in our straight chain are both circled because they're members of the ring. Um, and so we don't have to account for them, we already have. So let's move over to carbon number four. Um, once we get to carbon number four or these asymmetric carbons, uh, we use the desert we use the acronym LERD to help us remember how to place the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen group on carbon number four. And LERD stands for, L stands for left, U is up, R is right, and D is down. So if it's on the left, you put it up. If it's on the right, you put it down. And so in carbon number four, we have OH on the right. We have hydrogen on the left. So the hydrogen, because it's on the left, goes up, and the OH group goes down. We go to carbon number three, and again we have hydrogen on the left, we have OH on the right, and so on the left, hydrogen is up, and the OH on the right is down. 
on carbon number two. This time the OH is on the left and the hydrogen is on the right. And so the OH is up and the hydrogen is down. So that gets us around to carbon number one. Now before I go, we, we can see on carbon number one there's an OH and an H we have to place. Uh, but how do we do that? It's a little bit different for carbon number one. Carbon number one, remember, was the carbonyl carbon. It's also, in sugar chemistry, known as the anomeric carbon. The carbonyl carbon is always the anomeric carbon. And so, in this case, anytime you have the anomeric carbon, or the one that gets attacked by the hydroxyl group, realize there's actually two ways that that hydroxyl group could have attacked the uh, carbonyl carbon. Um, now, on a 2D plane, you can see I just drew a, a line going all the way down from carbon 5 all the way up to carbon 1. But in actuality, what would happen is, is that hydroxyl group, if you were to have this 3D structure and you're holding it in your hands, you would actually pull that hydroxyl group, you could pull it towards you, and then down upon carbon number 1, or you could have pulled it away from you behind the screen as we see it on in front of you behind the screen and come up from the back side of carbon number one. In cells, it's the same way. These things can cyclize either way. And depending on which way it cyclizes, whether it comes one direction or the other direction, will dictate whether the OH should be up or down, or the vice versa, the H would be up or down. And so basically, both those exist. And so you actually have two different forms of these cyclized products, one where the OH in this case is up and one in the, where the OH is down. In this example, though, I ask that the, we draw it in the alpha form. And what that means in the alpha form is that the OH would be opposite of the large group on carbon number 5, namely our CH2OH, which I just put an arrow towards. Notice our CH2OH is up in this case. To draw the alpha version, the OH on carbon number 1 would have to be down, and the H would be up. When the OH is down and the CH2OH is up, and I'll draw arrows to each of the OH group, when one is down and one is up, now it doesn't matter who's down and who's up, but if one's down and one's up, uh, that's alpha. If they're both up or they're both down, it's beta. Uh, again, both those exist when inside cells, when these cyclize. They don't necessarily exist at 50-50 ratios, but they both do exist. And so we drew the alpha version here. And so now we have correctly drawn our, our structure. Uh, this is now alpha. Get rid of all our extra marks. This is alpha D altro pyranos. Uh, alpha meaning we're in the alpha form. Uh, D because that's what we started with. We started the D altros and pyranos because it's a six membered ring. And so there's the proper structure for alpha D altro pyranos.